Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. It's funny uh, mentioning like some people in person, some people online, and this is giving me flashbacks to my first year teaching high school um, because I started in on the hybrid model where I was in class teaching some students in person, like five maybe, and then the rest were online. And so it was, I'm very much used to or I got, I learned really quickly how to engage both. So it's kind of fascinating to get back to it. Thank you so much for being here. I have my studio that you can see inside of, and I have all of my materials at like easy reach, as well as work that I wouldn't be bringing to the gallery. So I have pieces that I can show you where I learned certain techniques and such. So that's pretty cool. Um, so you get a little sneak peek. So Cancion del Perro, Song of the Dog. This show is really special to me because I, the title specifically is something that I've harbored or like kept saved for a very long time for like a few years now. And I really love animals as is very apparent in all of my work. If you've seen older work of mine or follow me on any of my social media outlets, there's always animal imagery. And there's a bit of like mysticism, lore, monsters, ghosts, spirits, all sorts of that visual language that pops out throughout my work. But dogs especially have been uh, very close to me. I grew up surrounded by animals um, and very much always outside in the ranch, in El Monte. That leads me into a little bit about who I am as a person. I'm from Laredo, Texas. I grew up there on the border and I had a very big family, which is a very exciting and fortunate thing for me, I, I feel, because I grew up surrounded by like, like a bunch of cousins. I have one brother an older brother but I had so many older and younger cousins and we we're all just always outside um, and I had lots of tias and tios on both sides of my family every weekend was like carne asadas and, and going out to the ranch and hanging out with family I find that it was a very rich upbringing for me and we all grew up very much enjoying like the rituals that I feel are very special to what happens in big families one of the things that we would do and this leads me to like my show especially um, or my body of work since graduating with my thesis from UTSA is rekindling and taking up the role of storyteller. So when I was young, like growing up, like my earliest memories, I would, we'd be outside, it was dark, and we'd have a carne asada, and um, we would gather around the fire, the pit, or just like in the dark and tell stories. My family is very connected to our spirituality whether that can be taken as something that's just like interested in what lies beyond the unknown, something that is more religious, or just something that is spiritual related to the soul. All of those are very interconnected and very much focused around nature as well. And that is because of my grandfather. While I was in graduate school, after I had left Laredo to pursue my education, right, I went to Texas State for my undergraduate degree. I went to UTSA for my master's degree. And that disconnection from my family as I'm navigating my 20s, as we as we do as we're, we're growing up and learning how to be an adult, kind of like disconnected me a bit from my family. And when my grandfather, who was very much like the pillar of my family, on my mom's side, he was dying. It made me, or it really forced me to like look back at who I am as a person facing that loss and why I am the way I am. What what are my interests? Like, why is, why is that so? Like, why do I love animals? Why am I so interested in what I'm making work about? What am I truly interested in making work about? That's when I started to really delve into the stories that I grew up with, the experiences that my family have had that were maybe unexplainable and as well as folklore or leyendas that I grew up hearing that felt very much normal to me. Um, it felt very, whereas like when you're disconnected, it's kind of like you you shift away from that belief or maybe you question things more or you just completely shut it down, which is completely normal as you're growing up. I think it's good to question things and I think it's good to explore and tease at, but I also think it's really important to honor where you come from and to honor your family with whatever experiences that you've had with them, good or bad. It's just part of who you are as a person. So getting to the dog. There are some different lore that I heard growing up that made the dog extra special. I know that the cat is very much the immediate figure of a tie to magic or let me like 
the unearthly or the otherworldly. But I think the dog has a very silent and beautiful connection to both us and to maybe the side of the wild that we are very much separated from now. And I'll talk about the work, I guess, as we walk through each piece. So Song of the Dog, this piece in specific, this painting is I kind of like my love letter to what dogs have brought to me in terms of joy. As a woman and as someone who has dogs, I find a lot of security and comfort in them, in what they maybe can sense or see or hear in their different senses. And so I think like navigating the world as someone who may be like smaller or very aware of what's around the dangers, especially after the last several years of consistent world wide trauma with what we've gone through. I find for myself, but I think I noticed that lots of people found comfort again in animals and the slowing down of processes, being home and the safety that you can feel from something that loves you unconditionally. So this dog that, this is a self-portrait. <laughs> So this dog that's um, surrounding me, kind of like an aura, is like a combination of my two dogs that I own. So I have Jimbug and Maybelline, and it's a bit about like where I'm at personally right now as a woman, as an adult, I'm like 29 years old, have my first house. So this is me celebrating what that means, as well as my fears of what the unknown is, people, other people around that I may not know what their intentions are. It's viable fears that I think a lot of people have that maybe they don't talk about often. So I wanted to show that in this painting of like me finding warmth and comfort and like a very different type of connection and love within my own animals. Above the house is like a smoke, a deer turning, morphing into um, a dog-like mist into the moon. In most of my work, not just even in the show, I kind of use very specific visual languages to describe different versions of myself or maybe the human condition as a woman, as my, from my perspective. So like the deer is like the soul and anything that's canid is very much the earthly embodiment of of a woman. There's the protection, the loyalty, especially to your kin, I guess, as from my own perspective. So whenever those characters show up in my work, I'm kind of channeling a very specific part of me that I think all lives within each of us. So the soul up into what the soul is becoming in the body. And I wanted to make it celebratory of also the plants and the animals that kind of like live around me. As a person, I love native species of plants and I've been looking into that and seeing how I can bring in more and more creatures to my home, just probably annoying my neighbors. I have, there's like snakes that live amongst us, raccoons, armadillos, and other things that just are bringing pollinators in. And I just think it's kind of a lovely lovely thing to coexist and to invite those back into my life, being apart from that for so long. This, that's what this piece is mostly about. It's that love letter. The more so when my work, each show that I do, I try to incorporate my own experiences, lore that I heard growing up, as well as my own turn to storytell. This is kind of like my own perspective as a person and where I am currently. And that's another tie to what this piece is about as well. It's another self-portrait, which is like new for my body of work because I've always been afraid to actually put my image within my artwork. I don't know why that always scared me before, but I, I do think that's important to also celebrate who I am. And so that's where I'm at currently. But in here is Maybelline. <laughs> one of my larger dogs who I find the most safety with. And again, it's coming across the unknown. And while I was painting this, that figure that's across the river, it's not a specific person, but I did want to paint what it would be like to encounter maybe my grandfather or people who have passed in my life that I really cared about because death has touched us all at this point, especially within the last few years. And my mom, when I was making this painting, she was like, it reminds me of La Virgen. She is like welcoming to you to what adulthood would be like. So it's kind of like a little bit of a collaboration between my mom and I. And so I wanted to embrace what either of those could mean and keep it kind of open-ended as well. The piece reminds me of the ranch that we had growing up, which after my grandfather passed, uh, my family sold it because no one could keep up with it, which is um, completely, it's sad, but it makes sense for where all the children were heading to, all my tias and tios. But I still dream about that place because it was such a unique part of my upbringing and a lot of people's upbringing from this area. To have pieces of land where your family would maybe gather and 
have celebrations and birthdays and experience what that connection to land could mean like in a post suburbia or living in the city. So I do channel those types of landscapes in my work a lot now as well. All right, so this piece, Song of the Dog. I, I was really excited. This is the first piece I made for the show. This was the catalyst. So when I was little, I used to always hear dogs could see death coming like as a manifestation. And there was a very specific tell that they would give to warn you. And so for me, the dog, it's, I mean, I would love to know what, what they say or what they think or how they communicate. We hear barks and yips and, and calls and howls. And for me, a howl is like a song from them. So that's where the title kind of comes from, Song of the Dog, the Howl. And it is said that if a dog in your neighborhood howls three times in a row, howls like a full howl to another howl to another one, that that means death is imminent to someone in that neighborhood. When I was little, that was really scary. Sometimes I would get my anxiety and like I would feel dread and I would listen to hear a dog howl and like, okay, it howled once. Let's let's see, is it going to howl again? And so I wanted to chat a little bit of what that like mystery could look like in like a physical form. Needle felting is really beautiful because it's not as maybe it's a soft sculpture so it has like a different type of feel to it it's alluring it reminds me of a bit of stuffed animals which is very childlike from my memories of growing up having lots of stuffed animals loving animals in general it's alluring it's soft i wanted to show it crying and i wanted to incorporate a visual of howling could look like so i wanted to make a separate piece where the different howls were holding on to different undulating forms that also held symbols or words. So there's ghost on there, what what death could look like. There's symbols and different imagery to show what maybe the dog could be like communicating on what it's seeing. That piece is really fun. This piece right here, this rug hooked piece, is, it's my very first rug hooked piece. Um, I did this one in 2019. This was my very first exploration into the stories that my family has told me growing up. So it's very special. I learned how to rug piece, rug hook with this piece, this very specific piece. And this is about the dog man. It's, it doesn't actually like that story doesn't really have a title because it's so personal to my family, but I wanted to combine two of the stories that I heard growing up. And then the paintings that accompany that, all those different watercolors tell every single part of the story in very short uh, visuals. Like you can think of them as like vignettes to part of that whole. So with this story, well, in this image, you see like a bipedal dog with a hand that is translucent over on top of his body. He is also speaking. If you look closely, he has human hands and there are different visuals within the thought bubbles or the speech bubbles. And underneath him are dogs that are crying out, also in pain with him. They're representative of strays. And the story behind this dog, along with the visual images of the watercolors, it's really cool. So when I first heard this story, I was really young and we were having one of our uh, carne asadas where we were like telling stories and experiences. And my tío, he is a, he's a cop. He would tell us stories about things that he would encounter when he was, especially when he was young and first starting out. He had this one experience that really shook him. He was alone. It was after he would shadow someone. He didn't have like a partner at this time. He was also given like the areas of Laredo that were like closer to the river, a little rougher. And one day, patrolling down a neighborhood in his vehicle, he came across um, a lot of stray dogs in a street, like in a neighborhood, like lots. So much so that it was disturbing. Like there was so many dogs and they were all congregating towards um, like the middle of the neighborhood. And he said that he shined his rights and saw a dog that was very large and it was sitting on the curb. And it almost looked like a person sitting hunched over and so when he shined his brights and saw all the dogs surrounding that one dog, that one human-like dog, the creature looked at him, stood up on its two legs and ran. And it totally shook him. He didn't really know what to think of it. And so he told us that story growing up. When I was little, I like really loved being the storyteller. Like I loved taking my experiences with my family and sharing it with my friends. And so I'd go to sleepovers and I would scare the bejesus out of my friends. And it was so fun and so exciting. <laughs> 
And so one day I told this story that I just told you and one of the girls started crying. I asked her like, why are you crying? It's okay. Like, don't worry. Like, it's just a story. Um, you're not going to go downtown and see a dog man. Don't worry. And she told me that this experience that my tío had kind of solidified the story she grew up hearing about a homeless man in downtown Laredo that was taken in by a bruja. For those that don't know, a bruja is Spanish for a witch. They are someone who maybe toys with uh, maybe magic that could be menacing or harmful to others. So this bruja took him in, which is like the very first image of the painting all the way at the very end. So she finds this man who is sitting on the sidewalk, brings him in, and she has her lechusa underneath an owl, which is like another form of what the bruja could take as stories that I heard growing up. And she gives him shelter and food and safety. And so that's the next image uh, where she brings him in. In return, he is supposed to bring her what she needs to facilitate whatever her rituals are. And so there's an owl above. She's watching, making sure that he is actually doing what he is supposed to do in order to earn his keep. This is the part that I always thought was interesting. My friend told me, and this is from her, what happens to the man is after a long period of time, she wanted him to bring her a child. And so it was just to kidnap a kid. And he was wrestling with it, uh, like the morality of it. And so in this painting, it's kind of her showing like the type of spell that she needs with images of babies and children, what that could mean. And her shadow again is the lechusa. And then the next painting is him in torment, not entirely sure of what to do. And so by this time, he has had food and wealth and happiness from doing everything that she asked of him. So he is unable to fulfill this request because he doesn't know what will happen to the child. Here, she, in order to make him a more faithful man, she turns him into a dog. And I thought that was one of the most pointed things that I heard from a story ever. <laughs> Um, so here she is turning him into the beast that is forever cursed to be a dog and to walk around Laredo. And so she heard the story of his origin and never heard of actual any sightings until I told her about my tío who saw this bipedal dog downtown appearing to be speaking to the strays in the streets, which is the last one, is him telling his story to the only things that can hear him now or understand him, which are the dogs. He is also in this story talking about above him his experience, so it kind of replays a bit of all, what all the paintings show. And then this is like a recreation of that first tapestry that I made, which is the combination of the two stories. But now I'm exploring what my friend had told me growing up, which is really cool. It was really shocking to hear that from her. And I never told anyone about it until I made the tapestry. And then I told my tío about it. And he said, well, he was, she, she was shocked because he hadn't heard the origin or he hadn't heard anything besides what he had seen. But he did tell me that not too many years ago that he saw the same creature walking on the bridge because you can see the bridge like depending on where you're at in Laredo like the bridge to Mexico and he said that he saw the dog again walking up on the bridge crossing over which I thought was real spooky and really exciting. All right so this big piece this one was very new to me because I was incorporating different pieces of felt fabrics to recreate a scene. When my grandfather was a lot younger when he was alive and his kids my tias my tios my mom um, were young. He told us that he used to love to just like lay outside in the backyard. And so the back porch, there was a porch with a concrete slab and then the concrete slab extended out into the backyard. The backyards were mostly chain link fence or like um, concrete. And so it was low enough that you could see all the different yards, at least to like an extent on both sides. And he used to love laying on the concrete, looking at the stars and he would kind of pray or he would um, meditate or think about life. It was his like quiet time. But one day when he was laying in the backyard, one side of the neighborhood, he heard a lot of dogs barking, but it was very vicious sounding. That yard became silent and it traveled to the next yard. And the dogs again were violent barking on either side. So aggressive. And then the next yard, the other one became quiet. Lots of dogs barking, lots of aggression. And then finally his dogs in his backyard started up. And he said that as he was laying there, he saw something flying really low above 
his backyard. And all of his dogs were running towards it, barking violently, aggressively crying. And as quickly as it flew over his yard, it went to the next yard. His dogs calmed down. And then those dogs were barking and crying and warning. And then again to the next yard, barking, crying, warning. And so I wanted to recreate that experience that he had in this by showing different dogs crying and warning and begging and gritos and, and yowling and, and showing their confusion and fear of what is possibly flying above. I wanted to make it fun though and like a little bit cute and, and inviting as well. So flat colors, really choppy fences, a little bit naive looking. The ghost above it is, I think it's so fun. I, I'm actually really excited with the way it turned out. It's very simple, but I think it encompasses that inner fear when you're young and you see something and you're like, oh my gosh, and it ends up being a cloak. So I just thought that was terrifying growing up and hearing that story. It only happened to him once, but I thought it was really cool the way that the dogs kind of like kept at bay, whatever it was, whatever was flying above. And he never saw exactly what it could be. And then each of the dogs that I chose, I thought were really on point with what the dogs that I grew up seeing around Laredo. The only one that's missing is probably like a husky, but like lots of German shepherds, lots of chihuahuas, pit bulls. So the black dog is like a German Shepherd mix. And then I used my cousin's pit bull as a model for the, the pit bull in the middle, really floppy looking, really big, like a fat head, just adorable. And then the little cheese that were everywhere. They're the ones I think that are really fun, especially that pink one. That pink one's kind of my favorite because it's looking up and howling and they're such small dogs, but man, they have like the loudest voices. That's what this piece is about. And I hope to learn different techniques just to make this. And so I got... A lot of this is actually from upcycle stores, where like reuse stores where they take donations and then sell really inexpensively the materials back to keep things out of the, the landfill. Um, there's a store in San Antonio, Texas called Spare Parts. And so I got lots of material from them, uh, beads and fibers and such. So I wanted to incorporate that into this just to, that's like a become an important part of my process now is to reuse and recycle. Thank you for that. Installing it, I read all the labels and all your information and talking to you, but I think I learned a lot, especially those watercolors. You get a little bit from the label, but that's interesting that your, your friend had the same experiences. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for having me and thank you all for joining virtually or in person. 